Hey guys, we're here in Georgia near our headquarters doing a lot of testing today. We're testing the leading hunting veins and broadheads against our new LRP system with tack veins and swacker broadheads. It's gonna be some cool stuff today. Let's get to it and see what happens. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> the rage has zero blades left. I, I knew something was going on. I was like, that to the table, dude. <laughs> So I'm here with Rick, our engineer. We're testing time to stabilization with the tack veins. And we've always felt like the sooner you could get that arrow to stabilize and start turning, uh, the more accurate and consistent it's gonna be downrange. And we feel like tack has an advantage over every other vein because of its stiffness. So we've got, we've got a Phantom high-speed camera and we've got a controlled set of arrows over here. All the arrows weigh exactly the same. And what we've done is we've got our three fletch, we've got our four fletch, and we're basing that or we're comparing that to our nearest competitor competitor veins to see if the if those veins are capturing the stabilization any quicker or any any longer time than the tack vein. The first test we did today I think was time to stability when the seeing which arrow started spinning or which vein started spinning the arrow sooner. This should be our 275 three fletch. Let's see if I can make this bigger here. There we go. So there's 90 degrees. And, yep. So we go, I guess from knock, right? So from the time it left the bow would be right there. Okay. To... So that's about six inches. Yeah, to hit 90 degrees about. And it's about three. six inches right there. About five feet, right? One, two, three, four, about five, five feet. Yeah. yeah. For the first 90 degree rotation. Yeah. Okay. That, the vein we can see up top is at 11 o'clock when it left the bow. Mm -hmm. So now it's at 90 degrees or three o'clock. Now it's at oh. seven. About the same. A little About five better. Feet. A, little, a little bit better. A little more. Not but much more though, honestly. It seemed what is like that? it was 70, starting 75 to spin degrees. faster yeah. though. It basically replaced the other one, so that's 75 degrees. Yeah. Not much. Not much more. Like I feel like in the field today, we were seeing more spin, but it's not actually much more. No, it's, it's than pretty the close. Flesh. Yeah. This should be the boning, the blazer, which in the field today looked like it spun a lot coming out of the bow. One dead straight up. And it is at 90, 90 there. Yeah. About right there, 90. So it's a lot like the, our four fletch. Mm -hmm. Spinning a little more than our three fletch. Coming out of the bow. Which is probably where you get some of that sound. Two from a boning. So then we went to the black background to see better. It's Q2I. That there is, only, it's not quite as good as our four fletch. Between our four and our three, I feel like probably to get to nine. Is that a three or a four? Yeah. Is that a four fletch? That's a four yeah. fletch. And they're okay. four fletched at 90. This would be maybe AAE. Yeah. Might be hard to see. Almost like our yeah, three right fletch. There. Yeah. Same spin rate coming out of the bow. And that will be, this is flex fletch, you can already tell. Yeah, it is about like our three fletch, maybe a little slower, honestly, mm -hmm. on spin rate. Maybe about an inch. Which is probably one of the reasons it hit higher in the group mm -hmm. down range. I'm starting to see like, yeah, the, very the slower spin rates are going higher. Are, are hitting, are holding their they velocity less arrow down drag. They have less mm -hmm. drag down range. Starting to see a direct correlation there, for sure. This would be DCA. So I bet it's spinning pretty hard here. Yeah. So it's hitting 90 very soon. Like comparative, probably about like where the four fletches are hitting. And that's one of the reasons it hit. It drugged so much wind and hit at the bottom on every test. And it's a flapper, so it's mm -hmm. slowing down. Yeah, big time. So that is all the time to recovery.
So now for the drop test uh, and what we're testing here with all LRP arrows, pack veins, and then our competitor veins on the same arrows. We're testing how much they drop uh, compared to one another at 75 yards. This is something we hadn't seen. This is our drop on our scale. This is our three foot. It comes in at nine, mm -hmm. a little over nine, like 9.2 right there. Then this will be our four fletch, I think. Yeah, it would come in at 6.1 probably, six. This would be the flex fletch maybe. Come through exactly. Bam. Yeah. Exactly like. Wow. Here's the AAE and it's at four. Four. Yeah. It's at four, so it's quite a bit lower. That's a Q2I one or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's Q2I. Yeah. So it comes through with about four and a half. Blazers, and they come through about five and a quarter. Should be the DCA one. Yeah. And it comes in at well, one. I mean, you see it spinning like crazy. Yeah, it's that's by far the worst performing one as far as downrange velocity. So exactly what we saw on impact, it was our 2753 fletch way higher, held it. Then the flex fletch and our four fletch 225 were almost identical. And then it was kind of uh, Q2I, then it was Blazer, and then AAE and DCA were fighting for so the bottom. DCA quite a bit lower. The, the common denominator is spin rate. Spin rate. So for the drop test, we've shot several groups um, just to make sure we're not getting just one weird, crazy thing and shoot one group and call that it. And what we're seeing very consistently is uh, the max delt and that the DCA um, consistently on drop or at the bottom of the group. Um, the blazer has kind of been all over the place and the hardest one to get a consistent reading on. Our 275 three fletch has been at the top every single group by quite a bit. Our four fletch, is that a 225? Yeah, I think. Yeah, 225. And then the flex fletch, three fletch, have been kind of side by side through the whole test. Uh, and then the Q2I has just kind of been in the middle of between our four fletch and the max stealth. Uh, every time. So we've got some good consistent feedback every time uh, doing this drop test, uh, which I think we've done about as good with it as you can. Yeah, I mean, we've got the high speed video. We've got them going across the witness panel so we can look at the rotation. Right. And we can see that on that grid board, right? And we clearly are seeing some separation. You know, this three fletches consistently. Matter of fact, the first time we shot it, we thought there was a problem with the hooter shooter. Right. Went back and reset it up, and shoot, nope, it's hitting up there again every time. It hits consistently about four inches higher right. than the others. So I think we know which one is, has the least amount of drag, right? right? Yeah. The four fletch has fallen in family with the three fletch, so it has the same drag. It's hitting elevation-wise in the same place but it'll also stabilize your arrow faster because you've got the additional vein, right? So I think the next step for me as an engineer, let's go shoot six and six and six and see if they group tighter. Which one's group tighter? We know that, yeah, this one's higher, but does it group tighter than the four fletch or are they the same, right? That's the next data that I'm interested in, right? Consistency's king. Right, yep. because yeah, even though maybe this hits a little higher, if that four fletch is a tighter group, yeah. that makes me a more archer, a more accurate archer right. and forgives my mistakes, right? I can have a bigger mistake with a four fletch, but still be in the kill zone. Yeah, exactly. So that's, as an engineer, that's what I'd want to see. As a shooter, that's what I want to see too. I'm not an engineer, but I like to hit where I aim. All right, guys, we are back for day two testing here. We're going to shoot the bow out of the hooter shooter, all our veins. Um, against our competitor veins from three fletch, four fletch, just kind of some different configurations. And now we're testing group sizes at 100 yards. Uh, and then if we have some time later, we're gonna test some other things, but that's what we're gonna get to first. Yeah, one of the key things we saw yesterday was spin rates, right? right yeah. So we saw a different spin rate, even though it's the same helical and the same fletching jig, we saw a little bit different spin rate between our four fletch and our three fletch. 
Now we want to try to narrow that down. Is one group better than the other? Right. Is there a difference? And if there's a difference, why is there a difference? Yep. So exactly. that's kind of where we're at today. Yep. We know that we definitely saw spin rate directly affect downrange velocity. Now we want to see if it directly affects grouping. Right. I can't, I can't say that any one vein grouped better than the next, mm -hmm. but what's clearly evident, and we saw this yesterday, not only yesterday, but today, now again, is that the tack veins, same arrow, same bow, same weight, right, are above the rest of the group, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. For sure. I mean, that's been our claim all along is that they, they will have less drag and that they should right. hit higher and ultimately we're proving that they did. I mean, every single time. Right. The 275 was considerably better, um, you know, but the 225s are, are staying right with them today. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So, you know, we do have, it's, it is outside, we do have intermittent breezes, so we're seeing a little left and rights, um, you know, with the breezes. So we can say, yeah, maybe this flyer was a little bit of the breeze. But overall, over the two days of testing, we consistently saw the elevation differences. Mm -hmm. And uh, that just kind of confirms it again today. You know, we were talking spin rates yesterday. You know, the, the 275s, you know, don't have as fast a spin rate as the 225s. We were really interested to find out whether there was a difference in the overall group size. That's not showing up. We're not seeing a major difference. Um, so yeah, I mean, now the decision is, you know, which one do you want to pick? So we were kind of just, really just did this for fun. Wanted to see how it would look going through a whisker biscuit and also just really show and understand stability in the vein itself, like about anything else, how a vein recovered, if it was to get contact with the rest, contact with the cable, um, just kind of the rigidity of the vein in itself. And so we shot a bunch of veins through a whisker biscuit. So this was our three fletch 275. Pretty minimal disturbance on the whisker biscuit going through, and really you don't see a lot of anything happening in the veins. A little bit of flex. Just a little kick, but it recovered right away. Recovered instantly, spinning good. Doesn't seem to affect the aero flight any. Yeah, that was a um, pretty stable looking arrow, even through a whisker biscuit. And then this would be our four fletch, two, six, or two, two, five. A little more disturbance in the whisker biscuit. But I think that a lot of the disturbance you're seeing is that vein hitting right in the in the oh, yeah. load V or whatever you want to call that. That's that and those fibers, yeah, they yeah they have they some blew place. everything out. Yeah, mm -hmm. so they blew up into that area. But Almost. even that, our veins are stable by the time they get to the scope housing. <laughs> Pretty much, you yep. know, a little past the scope housing, and they're spinning and off. But the same thing, it was like one lateral movement of the vein and it was in it, exactly. it came right back. That's what we're seeing, like if the vein hits something, it goes one time and stabilizes. Right. Mm -hmm. And the knock doesn't leave path. No. The knock no. stays on the path. I mean, that's something I was always concerned about with the stiffer vein, especially yeah. with launcher blade and things like that. Like, is it going to make it kick? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't really seem to. This shows it does. Well, that's what I'm, I'm, so like the big concern, even in tournaments, was initially, what if it hits my finger? What if I have blade contact? And everybody thought if you shoot a flimsy vein that it'll just crash through it and not. Mm -hmm. But the point is, it's not steering it at all anyway at that point. And now, like if some of this stuff we watch in the field today, like this would be the blazers here. And like, this is insane. So th this, like, so my story on this, right, is I've always told people, you can look at your biscuit and tell if your bow's not tuned because the fibers are getting destroyed. Right. And my brother is, he shoots that vein, right? Yeah. <laughs> and now I can go back and yeah. go take a look Show at that. Show him that screenshot That's right, right there. That ain't steering, that arrow don't even know which way to turn. No. And you watch the knock, it's already tailing off. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, that is a complete failure, in my opinion. So, and how many hunters out there are shooting those veins with a biscuit? Yeah, a ton. most of them. A yeah. ton of guys, right? Yeah, a ton. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is um, not doing anything until five feet, six right. feet. You know, that vein may be a good vein for a drop away, mm -hmm. but from what I'm seeing now, that vein is not a good vein for a biscuit. Well, we shot this vein too today on a drop away, and we it was the most sporadic vein by no, far you're, on you're, group. No, that's true. I forgot about that. Mm -hmm. But it's all hard. these guys that are bad mouthing whisker biscuits, what they're essentially doing is pounding the biscuit with this right, vein with, with that's causing the problem. Vein. Yeah. Yeah, that was rough to watch. This one is a Q2I. Yeah. This one doesn't recover as fast as the tack. No, it's got two, okay. it's got three wiggles, right? Mm -hmm. It's wagging the tail. It's, it's a lower profile setup. Yeah. Works pretty good to a biscuit. But it's a pretty thick vein too. Mm -hmm. And so it's gonna cause some disturbance there, but it recovered decently. Like every vein except that bottom one did well. But the one that went through that stiffer bristles, it took it a while. This one is a AE three fletch max still. Look at it. Did you see it turn that arrow? Mm -hmm. Look at that. Boom. Yeah. The whisker it's, biscuit turned. It's kickstarting the spin. Yeah. But then you look at that vein and it's yeah. folded double. And it looks like a bird flying right there. What? Mm hmm. That's what, the, that's what I don't like is these veins are porpoising so much out of most of these competitors' arrows, they're going in different directions. Yeah. And so they're not actually steering. The veins are collapsing on each other. If they were all turning the same direction, it would be one thing. They're not. But they're not. They're well, just they're going fighting, every fighting direction, each other. fighting each other, and that arrow mm. don't know which way to spin. And it's spinning in a choppy motion. It's like yeah. Now I'm gonna. I don't know which direction my bow shoots my bear shaft. So right. I mean, I've never really looked at that. Um, I I don't know that we proved it today, but I just don't think it makes much difference with our veins. You know, but right. I think our, yeah, I think our veins of all of them will, are recovering for sure fastest. No, oh, you can't dispute that. No. Yep. Right, that's right there and why you can't dispute it. This is the flex fletch. Still quite a bit of oscillation in the vein mm -hmm. itself, but it goes through the biscuit pretty well. And it doesn't look like it affects tune any. But those veins are, it's really not even the, the it's the very tip of these that look like they're, like there's a wave in it. Mm -hmm. it's but like this is going long ways right. as much as off of the arrow. Right. I feel like the flex flight today, in my opinion, performed as close to it of any of the competition as far as like our drop, the rotation. It was within family, right? It was within family. Yeah. It wasn't like, oof, no mm -hmm. thanks. Now we're bringing the ribs into the picture for a more real world experience, so to speak. Uh, we've got Randy here shooting. Our goal is to hit each rib dead center with each one of the broadheads. So again, that we have a more consistent test from each broadhead, you know, one broadhead to the next. So let's let it rip and hopefully it hits the ribs. Almost didn't have enough gel. That one hit a rib. That one right through the middle of the rib. Looks like it tried to come out the bottom. <laughs> it's in the table, dude. <laughs> it still penetrated the table after it went beyond the other broadheads. So top one was LRP. Right. So two inch. It was just below a rib, so it didn't quite hit it. Right, and it's it's but right out in the front, right? Fully deployed and everything. Yeah. It's dead even with the next head down. This was kind of hard to actually hit the rib bone and get a Yeah, we tried. Bone. I mean, some hit ribs direct, some hit between ribs. And that's the fallacy of trying to do that test because you're not necessarily right. consistent, right? Mm-hmm. So this we all know rage. deer don't have plywood, but it's consistent. Right. Next one down was a Rage, 
and the raised one blade looks like it caught the top of a rib and it seems to have kicked it out and deployed the right one left one right. never deployed when you look in here the right one no, you know, like you said, never deployed. Yeah, I think that. So he only had one it. blade deploying, right? So in retrospect, it's got half the cut as a swacker, penetrated the same, but only half the cut. Mm -hmm. This is a rage, right? Yeah. And it went between the rib as well mm -hmm. and penetrated great. That one, mm -hmm. one opened because one caught on the right side and pushed the right. Right. Or left side and push the right blade open. We looked open. at the ribs. Left one right. would never open. Yeah, there was oh, only, only one blade. Only open. one blade seemed to open because you didn't have the full two inch cut coming on the inside cavity side of the rib. So next one down was a NAP. Right. So that one just barely missed the bottom of a rib, just a little bit below it, but um, right. it didn't it's quite deployed. penetrate as far, but it did fully deploy. Blade didn't mm -hmm. break or bend. That didn't. So this is an NAP kills on that stayed closed. closed yeah. That one seemed to do well. Didn't penetrate as well as the swacker, but the angle. And we got the major deflection. Yeah. That's probably why it didn't penetrate. Right, and the one test that we didn't get the high speed video, right, when we were doing just ribs, mm -hmm. that deflected so bad it actually snapped the golden snapped tip the shaft. Yeah. Yeah. Whoa, broke the barrel. Wow. That gets back to what we were seeing before with these deflections in the big arrow bending. You lose a ton of penetration. So we got a lot of deflection on the NAP today. But I think it's those um, those wings that stick out right there that and it throws the blades out. If it hits a rib on one side, it was just pushing it hard. Still probably killed the animal right there. Um, next one was uh, Grim, Grim Reaper. Reaper. And that one smashed dead center on a rib. It looks to have two blades. And I think it's missing a third one. Yeah, it's hard to see, but it does look like it's missing a blade. No, you know what? It is there. Is it? Can I can see, see it? it now. Okay. Yep. So that one actually did make it that time. So it did hit a rib dead on, so the tip blew the rib out of the way, mm -hmm. and the blades followed through. That that hit a rib, for sure. Mm -hmm. And about like the kill zone deflected. Right. Same kind of A lot of arrow whip, a lot of bend. A lot of bend. And all that's doing is taking your penetration away. Yeah. You know, when you get major deflection out of a broadhead. If it hits just right, it's hard to not get a little deflection. Well, you're going to see that even even with like an iron wheel head, right? Mm -hmm. If you hit right on that radius on the blade, yeah, it turns it. it's going to deflect it a little bit, so you're going to see that, mm -hmm. right? So anybody that gets a warm fuzzy that thinks that's not happening, that's, that's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. Even with any head, like even the way those ribs in a, an animal curve, mm -hmm. and you hit that, it's going to deflect it. That's point. one of the reasons why I'm always real leery about frontal shots on animal because of the way the ribs kind of curve to the mm -hmm. center. So if you happen to start deflecting, once it you start, you're, you got a major problem trying to get through. And then this was a mega meat, and mega meat that center punched a rib, it smashed it, broke it. Penetrated about the same as a NAP. One blade looks like it maybe have went back in can't tell, but I'm not seeing, on this near side, I'm not seeing a blade. Yeah. We'll have to pull it out Not see. positive on that. This was a mega meat, right. that. one blade there. open. Not sure. Um, destroyed the Grim Reaper. <laughs> so, um, went through kind of between the ribs. Hard to say on that blade being open. Mm -hmm. Well, there's pretty much every one of these I like spun and everything. So, you know, no, we spun like them shut. all. Yeah. yeah, that was the mm -hmm. thing is that yeah, you spun them well, all. Well, this was one of the reasons. Uh, well, the whole purpose 12 years ago when I went to a swacker was because I missed the biggest antelope of my life because of Rage Open, you know. And so I went to Walmart and bought swackers, killed the, went back and killed the antelope, and I've been shooting them ever since. But that's what I don't like about all these locking cams and Stuff. It's just so hard to get it seated for me. Well, and then if it's it? open more than once or twice or fiddling with it, do you, is, does it have enough friction anymore, right? right? How do you quantify that? Mm -hmm. And it, I think the one thing that we saw today is that like all the blades that are super intricate or have something that bends to open it and everything, they're just not robust enough. Mm -hmm. You know, like our simple blade design keeps it simple. And last one, the uh, 150 grain three inch swacker. Actually went into the table. Yeah, went into the table. I don't know if you can see that. 
but it's buried in the table. So it had enough energy to bury into the table. Had it stayed up in elevation, it would have penetrated even at the three inch cut out beyond these others. Yeah, and I mean, that's wider than most of your deer Yeah, right off the bat. And in high speed, we can actually see it go down just a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So this is interesting, right? We did hit right on the edge of that rib, mm -hmm. deflected it down, but it, and that's the three inch, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it still had enough energy that it actually penetrated through the table. Right. And you can see before it goes into ribs, the blades are horizontal, and that's why you're not seeing a giant wound channel. Yeah. Because it cut it horizontally. But, but it, it did hit, deflect quite a bit. Yeah, it hit right on the mm -hmm. on the round part of that rib, uh, right on the tip, right? So it just followed it down. Yeah, and then ruined Joe's table. Yeah. But yeah, we did get some, definitely cool seeing those deflections mm -hmm. off those ribs, which is a lot of times why I think as bow hunters, we see it go in in a certain place. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you jump the deer track in it, you're like, what the heck's going on? And your exit's like eight inches from where you think it should be. So, I'm gonna double the ribs up. So we can get the ribs to overlap like this. That way we're not worried about hitting in the gaps. We're actually going to hit a rib mm -hmm. dead on with each shot. That'll be the goal. So what we've done now is we've doubled up the ribs. We've got two, two sets of ribs. We're trying to overlap them so that we absolutely hit a rib with each broadhead. And we're also going to have a high speed camera on the inside of the rib cage, which would be inside the chest cavity on an animal, so we can see how the broadheads are reacting when they blow through that first side. Went through the top edge of the rib, but a blue bone out the back side, so that's going to be cool. Two that's inch. the, the, the two, the, yeah. two inch. LRP. So well, you can yeah. see it's opening already on the back yeah, side. Yeah, and it definitely hit ribs, right? Yeah, and this is, we doubled them up. Yeah, we yeah. doubled them up just so to make mm. sure that we hit gotcha. one or something, and it crushes bone out. Yeah. Mm. And you see that arrow kind of oscillate and come through there, but That's I think the, you'll see it way worse with yeah, the other one. Yeah, and that was the thing that jumped out of me when we started looking at all of them is how much bending we were seeing. Right. Yeah, because that's going to take away penetration too, and just showing how much force it takes to open them up. I see bone. Bone. It's all bone fly. Yeah, looked like all the blades are intact. There's a three blade hole in there. In the gel. Oh yeah, it is. Yep. So we definitely hit a rib. Stayed together that Stayed time. Stayed together that time. No, this is the Grim Reaper. Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty, oh, look at those blades close back up. Mm -hmm. And then you're seeing that arrow oscillate. Did pretty well, kind of went through the same wound channel as <clears throat> part of our two yeah. inch. Didn't do terrible right there, I didn't think. Oh, that deflected big that's time. Parts flew. That thing went all the way down. Oh, wow. I mean, it went in. But you don't have a, there's no big coal going through that right there. It went, and the entrance hole isn't big. No. It's real that small. hole's not big. But it was open here. On one side, it looks like. It has both blades, but something funky was going on there. Because you don't have a big hole coming through. I mean, I was shooting level, but it's you're an inch lower on that side. It deflected on this first rib here. Yeah. Had to have. Because it definitely kicked way down. But you don't have a big hole. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's well, less, less than an inch. It's definitely less than, I mean, it's an inch, inch and a half. This is the Rage. Holy Look how bad it deflects. Look at that arrow. Yeah. It's like an S. And it deflected down big time. You can see mm -hmm. it come through. But it went through the center of a rib, it right? It's not like it hit right, on the yeah. bottom edge. So mm -hmm. it's getting some really weird things happening right there. Yeah. I don't have a bigger entrance hole. Yep. Seems to have come straight through. Yep. Big, big exit. No, that's a mega meat here. We did okay. Yeah, that one did pretty good. It did pretty good. Not a whole lot. Got a of lot of shrapnel. A lot of shrapnel, but honestly, wasn't terrible. 
That one deflected. Like deflected. Down I seen it come through. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, definitely something's going on because it's got two you blades. Get, yeah, two one blade. and a half. Well, one. It's like one full one that way, half right. of one this way, nothing, nothing up. Nothing this way. See, it looks the same there. See, big blade, decent size, and then small. Can't tell. Yeah. Something weird going on. But yeah, you can see that it's definitely like a. Right there is a spot where there's a Maybe. big cutout in the blade, and it bends right there. Yep, every time. Most of the time, you know. So that's the one that hit the rib. You can see it's on the top. Didn't get a cut. And that's the only one that did, that hit a rib, so it didn't cut. So I mean, big cutting diameter is cool if it uses it all. Yeah, but it's not using. Yeah. You're, you're losing thirty percent at least on that run. Probably the one fifty. Yep. So the interesting a, thing is which ones are, when inch. they're going through the ribs, they're deflecting and which ones aren't, right? Yeah, I mean, we had several that were that same height that were in the table. Yeah. And that's the 150 grain three inch swacker. Went straight. Giant oh, blades. Oh, they're still razor blades. Are still straight. And I'm not gonna lie, we used that that same broadhead on like three different tests so far. <laughs> like, yeah. Just because it was still working and yeah. still fine, but we still, still have working no and still fine. That's been shot through three times. At least plywood and everything. So what's awesome yeah. is that we've seen today definitively that our two inch head and our 150 grain three inch literally have all but the exact same amount of right. penetration. They have it the same cutting width when they go through and when these blades open on the inside like they're doing, it's in the lungs, right? Doesn't mm -hmm. take much energy, right? But the key is these blades are open and after they get through, they haven't touched all the hide and bones by the time they get to the lungs. They're still sharp. This one's been through three times plywood, ribs, double ribs, and it's still shaving hair. This was our three inch. Mm -hmm. And it actually come through two sets of ribs, hit the, wood, hit the right plywood, there. and still the arrow isn't severely turning deformed. into yeah. like an S, but look at the destruction. Look at the ribs moving here. Mm -hmm. And the blade was still fine. It was just a little bit bent from there. Like yeah, it's the fine until it, it hits yeah, there. Yeah, because it hit that wood as Look it was at the trying to the bone deploy. fragments yeah. flying by. I think that was a shot where I said I 20 bone yards. like 20 yards. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was pretty cool. The rage looked like it kind of, they all blew through. Those are pork ribs or whatever we were using. Yeah. They all went through the ribs fine. But mm -hmm. the difference was watching the impact on the arrow, which is what's going to cost you penetration when you hit harder right. stuff. And the rage, I felt like, probably. It, the interesting the thing is it wasn't like we only saw it on the two rib test. We saw mm -hmm. it on the one rib test, and we were seeing it in the, in the gelatin, remember? Right. They were diving down mm -hmm. in the gelatin, so mm -hmm. we were seeing very similar results. Yeah. So this test here, we're going to be shooting into ballistic gelatin. And what we're going to start with is a piece of deer hide and then half inch plywood. The half inch plywood is going to kind of represent ribs of a deer or another animal you're going to shoot. I know you don't have plywood on animals, but that's the only consistent medium that we can use to be fair from broadhead to broadhead because one broadhead might hit a rib bone this way, might hit a rib bone that way. So we're going to start with this to have an equal playing field across all the broadheads and look at the total penetration into the gel after going through the plywood. Yeah, Rick, this is kind of uh, the more fun stuff I've been looking forward to all day, so I'm excited to, to see how everything stacks up. Me too. I, I, I like tearing things up and destroying things. <laughs> so holes through stuff. Let's yeah. do it. The, uh, which one is that? Is that the Spitfire? Yeah. It broke. Didn't even go in. The, uh, this one didn't make it through the plywood. Oh, that's, that's the a mega meat. No, that's, no, that's the, the mega fire. meat. Mega yeah. meat did the best. With the blade without a blade going. It, it broke the top blade. 
and this blade, That's it broke two bad. blades. Oh, yeah. the two blades that stayed on are bent all but bent all the way down. Over. So it did, the reason the mechanism so did it So it should bend, penetrate. <laughs> it's only got one blade going in there. So this our 150 grain three inch and our LRP, about the same penetration. Well, this is the carnage. Yep. So let's look at the swackers first. Pretty much everything is sharp yeah, still. Yeah, it's still razor sharp because it didn't go through the wood. Exactly. You could use it still. What's this one, Randy? This is the Grim Reaper. Yep. There are no blades left. They didn't make it through the plywood anyway. Well, Rage got blades, but they're detached. Rage are stuck <laughs> on the entrance. Even. Evenly. Yep. Went through with the ferrule, uh, but those completely broke off. Here's the Rage. And we have penetration with zero blades left on the ferrule. It's a hypodermic. A hypodermic, mm -hmm. and both blades are stuck in the plywood. I mean, it's a hypodermic needle. No. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is, yeah. It's just a poke. Just a well, that's poke. a good name then. Yeah. <laughs> I guess maybe I know where they got the name from. <laughs> because it's a field point, you're right. I mean, mm -hmm. the blades are stuck in the plywood. Still didn't penetrate. No, even, even without blades. blades. Without blades to a swacker. Fail. Um, this one should be the, the NAP, right? Mm -hmm. So let's see what happens here. Yikes. Back that up. The thing's it's open. open. It yeah, opened before yep. it got there. That actually explains more, but it does explain a little bit. Still. For sure. So that might have been a little bit of a misconstrued test, but it opened in flight, so. Yeah, but how does that even happen? I mean, like, they, they're they hard to even push back together. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no band, no nothing, right. and so, like... I don't know, but we didn't get uh, through the plywood either way yeah. on that. But it was open in flight. We don't know how that happened, so... And then this is the dead meat. One of the blades is stuck in the plywood. Mega meat. Mega meat. Yeah. One is completely broken and bent and one was still kind of deployed in there, so. The two blades. Two blades made it, and it penetrated good, but one of the blades didn't get through the plywood. But see, this is a prime example why design is brought in really for elk, right? Yeah. The biggest problem we were having with elk was trying to get through that first set of ribs. And this design clearly shows these blades are razor blade sharp because yeah. they didn't cut the board going in. So you've got a virgin blade that's hitting the lungs. Yeah, and that doesn't show you why like you hit a rib or something on the entrance, you're not even getting blades to the vitals. And that was always my argument for a swacker. This was impressive. So now we're gonna do a penetration test with the hide, plywood, and the gel uh, with the LRP two inch cut versus an iron wheel with a total of two inch cut as well. So uh, comparing apples to apples, we'll see how ours does against the iron wheel. Right, rib. and then we're gonna back that up with an inch and a half single bevel cut inch and a half total cut iron wheel versus a three inch swacker. And we'll see how they compare. LRP broadhead. All right, we got an iron wheel wide. Almost the same. Yep. All but identical. Almost, yeah. With that one kicked back, and I and we saw it already in high speed that every time when it, mm -hmm. it comes back out some. Right. Yeah, you want. You can see there's a tiny little gap here. Right. You can see the hole. That right one there. can go in. You can see that hole. Right. Right there. Right yeah. there. And That's that stops. as far as they penetrated. So. So what a quarter of an inch. Yeah. Half at the most. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, let's shoot these ones and see. And the yeah. difference would be you're cutting vitals with brand new blades with mm -hmm. the top one. Yeah. Not having to go through fur and bone. All right, this is the single bevel iron wheel. And then just for comparison's sake, we'll do the 150 grain three inch swacker. See how that compares. That's a three, that's a, that's a wound channel right there. 
So that's your full yeah. blown. Right. All the way in with each one. So we that out penetrated everything else by the, the small iron wheel by what an inch or two, two inches. Maybe. I mean, Maybe. if you look at the knocks, right? Yeah. yeah. But the but wound that's a channel. Three inch cut. Yeah, the wound channel. Is I mean, the, look at it. It's a three inch yeah. cut versus a one sure. inch cut. Yeah, our fill point would penetrate better. I mean, yep. like, what do you want? You want to, you want to penetrate or you want to kill it? I mean, however, I will give them this. The blades made it through, yeah. whereas yeah. any other competitors did not. Yeah, exactly. Through pl so, half-inch plywood, so, nothing else made it. So nothing let's else take, made it. Can we, can we pull the board back and look at the channel in the gel? It goes just as far in as the two. So you may not get an exit hole every time, right? right? And you have to die with inside. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> There's lots of controversy, right, in the archery world and social media over fixed blade, two blade broadhead, single bevel, all this stuff, right? And we wanted to see for ourselves what would really happen, compare them in an equal medium. So the hide, the board, and the gel. And we've got a two inch swacker that penetrated almost exactly the same amount as the, it's an actually an inch and a quarter cut iron wheel, but it's a four blade, so a total of two inches of cut. But you've only got an inch and a quarter wound channel on the one side where you've got a big two inch channel with the swacker. And then we wanted to just see what our 150, 100, our uh, 150 grain three inch cut would do. You've got a three inch wound channel going through there, not a little tiny one inch cut. And sure, the iron wheel went two inches deeper, but we've got a three inch cut in solid gelatin. Lungs don't have this density. They don't have the friction from the gel. They actually have lubrication. So that three inch broadhead was gonna to get to the other side of the animal without any issues whatsoever. So it's cool to blow through them and stick in the dirt, but why not convert that energy that you just put into the dirt into a bigger cut. And when you shoot them good, it doesn't make any difference. But I don't always shoot them good. And when I shoot them bad, that's why I like having that three inch cut. Because I feel I have a better chance of recovering a poorly shot animal, especially a gut shot animal, uh, with a lot bigger cut. And I mean, when you look at it this way, our broadheads didn't have to cut through hide and, and plywood either to get to the vitals. And I'm sure these blades made it through this time, but every other competitor we looked at that opens on contact broke before it even got through the plywood. Or the blades were or dull. Or they're dull. I've been waiting all day for this yeah, test. Yeah, this is cool. This is cool there's test. so much controversy on, yeah. on the web on this, yeah. on this subject right here. And I mean, I'll give it to them. They're tough and they made it through, but the difference in the wound channel is so drastic. It's like, yeah, I would never want to take an, an inch and a half, two inches of penetration, but sacrifice, right. you know, two thirds of a wound channel. Right. All right guys, so next up for our testing is the torque test, torture test, whatever you want to call it, where we're adding um, spin pressure, side pressure, any kind of um, extensive pressure to our component system, our competitors' component systems, the aero shafts, where the broadheads go in, the broadhead ferrules itself, just kind of everything because our ultimate goal has always been to build the most accurate system, but also the toughest system. Because if you can't shoot it through plywood or ribs or bones and still get in there uh, with a fully functional system, it doesn't really matter how accurate it is. So we're going to test ours against all the competitors and see what we figure out. So basically what we're doing is we're just checking the concentricity of all of the outserts, all the components we just assembled to make sure that they're, they're as true as we can get them and that we're not seeing biases as we do our test. Uh, we have a digital torque wrench that we're going to run a 261 ferrule into a stock component for each of these brands and then also we're going to compare it to the LRP front end system. Again, one of our main goals is to increase the strength and rigidity in the 166 components. So we have this digital torque wrench set up so that it's going to perfectly hold each ferrule in the same spot and we're going to bend them. First we're going to start at 5 foot pounds. We're going to spin the arrow first, make sure it spins true. Then we're going to put 5 foot pounds on it and then we're going to re-spin. 
If it's bent at that point, we already know how much torque that particular component is able to withstand. And then we're gonna go through and see exactly how many foot pounds it takes to actually break the arrow and just kind of see what we get. So uh, Rick, let's get started. All right, so five foot pounds with the victory. It felt okay coming off. Let's we'll see what it does. It's got a little bit of a wobble, more than it had originally, but it's not bad. Totally shootable, I'm sure. Yeah. You know, most people are never gonna see that difference, most likely. Go to seven foot-pounds now. Yeah. Clear wobble. It's, yeah, it's starting to displace, it's starting to bend. But at nine foot-pounds, Yeah, I can feel it. Oh yeah. Big wobble. <laughs> yeah, right now it's getting to the point where it's questionable. It's, I mean, I can't imagine it's gonna hit a spot at 40 yards. Depends on the broad hit. We ran through the scenario that we did with each of these brands. We did the gold tip arrow, a victory arrow, a Easton arrow, and we also did the Black Eagle. Um, each one of those in a 300 spine, and we just compared their stock component to our LRP component, just to see exactly what we had in a lateral torque test. And um, as you can see from the chart, we basically showed you know five foot pounds, seven foot pounds, nine foot pounds, and then where it broke. And um, you know pretty much every insert uh, made it through five foot pounds. Uh, the Victory did have a slight bend after five foot pounds. At seven foot pounds, um, there was a few more started to drop off. You'll see then at nine foot pounds, the only one that made it, other than the LRPs, was the Gold Tip. Uh, gold Tip, and it just took a slight bend at that point. And what I want to make clear is like. When we talk about a slight bend, we're talking it might have been 10 thousandths, something like that. And so is it going to hit a spot at 30 yards? Yes, it will. It's not going to be accurate at 100. And, um, and then the other thing I want to make clear as well, the component is as strong as the arrow. Most of y'all can agree that you can't hit enough of something in an animal to create that much lateral torque to actually snap the arrow just like that. Sure, if it sticks in them and they run off, it snaps then but it's not gonna snap right behind the component like that. So the whole point of our system here is to, to show that at that diameter, at 166, aluminum just isn't strong enough. And so we came out with that 17.4 H900 material, which is extremely strong, and that's what keeps it strong and straight. Um, you know, so that's the biggest point here that we're trying to make is that we have a component that's every bit as strong as the arrow or more. And so the component's never gonna be the weak point in this system. Hope you all enjoyed this testing and uh, you learned something out of it. Uh, please visit our contact us page on, on swacker.com or tacbanes.com. We'll be glad to answer any questions you have.